The science department at Forest Gate Community School has historically struggled to achieve the same level of success as the English and the Maths department. However, last year, we made significant progress and achieved, on average, one whole grade compared to the national peers. To achieve this success, we employed five high leverage strategies. Firstly, we designed a well-sequenced curriculum that was rounded, preparatory and challenging for all students. Right, so we planned our science curriculum as a five-year plan to essentially help our students perform their best at the end of year 11. But our plan actually, our curriculum, builds our students from year seven onwards and it actually builds them beyond the GCSE and I'll talk about that in a bit. So national curriculum only expects students to be aware of human digestive systems some organs, enzymes, how they function. We already go above it and beyond it because not only do we cover those key aspects, but we also now move on to food tests, other required practicals, which they aren't expected to know. Okay. But again, because we have broken it down so much, yeah. we've made sure that we're allowing students and we're giving them the opportunity to be able to access all that information yeah. by breaking it down as much as we possibly can before building upon it. All the science experts across our schools agreed on the 10 key ideas we want our students to develop over time. Okay. What is it that's exclusively taught to triple only? What do you combine highly to know that foundation don't? Once we have this, obviously then that allows us to make it very, very clear to all of our teachers, because some are experts, some are novice. Yep. Are they aware of the differences between the three courses? So developing subject expertise is very important. Of course, because if we're, uh, these teachers are going to be delivering this, they, know, mm. they need to know it, and that's our responsibility to impart that knowledge. We put them into our long-term plan and called it our KOs, and these are all visual for our students, parents, teachers, for all to see on our DPR. Key objectives. Of Key objectives, objectives. Yeah. and they're part of the 10 KOs. Mm. So each year, our students revisit the topic, but learn deeper. Okay. According to their starting point through their pathways. Okay. I mean, it's a dangerous situation when you get scientists in the room, I think, and you ask them to adopt on something. I don't know how you guys do it, but well done for adopting a curriculum. We debate endlessly until we agree. Until you agree to disagree. <laughs> okay. Secondly, we address the practice of block teaching of the three science disciplines, biology, chemistry, and physics. We addressed this aspect back in 2019 and ensured that each subject was taught simultaneously. Right, so this block teaching, my view, uh, is the evolution over time. If you look at it, yeah. it, it was a modular course. I yeah. mean, all courses were modular, not just science. Yeah. And the best way to teach modular course was you just do intensive teaching and learning for that topic and then they just see the test, forget about it, do this topic. And yeah. This is how modular system works and this is what how we all benefited from that module. That's right. This current system, if you do that, your students will, won't be able to recall that information later on. And when is yeah. the exam? All at the end of year 11. Science of Learning would advocate against that. I mean, it makes little sense for you to expect your students to recall information that was taught almost a year ago, for example. When we did move into teaching the different domains of science every week, it helped our learners, for, uh, most importantly, to retain information over a long period of time as opposed to absence of uh, reflecting on what they've learned for a prolonged period of time and suddenly we expect them to uh, recall and often teachers would say or in fact subject leaders would say uh, and blame the students for forgetting. Thirdly we produced our own curriculum booklets to provide clear contents and a clear structure for our teaching. Uh, we came across curriculum booklets in um 2020 when I went to visit Michaela, yeah. um, uh, I was inspired by one of the conferences they held for science yeah. and I had a look at their curriculum booklets which was brilliant um, but I came, knocked on your door and I said I can do this and I can do it even better yeah. and I think we've achieved that. Good, we like doing that, we, I know we like stealing things, shiny objects. Yes we do, we yeah. do and I'm very proud to say that our curriculum booklets are, like you said, we're constantly reviewing and our yeah. curriculum booklets are just getting better and better. We focus on obviously 10 key objectives and those 10 key objectives are given to staff but they are open to interpretation okay. and I think by standardising uh, our lessons via curriculum booklets we make sure that we are outlining what we want the students to achieve. We're making sure there's a right amount of challenge and the right amount of scaffolding and they're based on the pathways we have in our classes. Mm. Uh, I think with sometimes what happens in science lessons is that there's a variety of different lessons mm. and different qualities based on the experience of staff and mm. this makes sure 
that every class is getting um, receiving the right amount of uh, content, uh, right amount of curriculum time, uh, right amount of slot, which is shed loads of practice. Why, why not choose a textbook, though? Because there are many publishers out there who have published great science textbooks. Why curriculum booklets as opposed to textbooks? I think textbooks, are, are, there are some really good textbooks out there where they've got a lot of content in them, but there's more content than there is independent practice and a lot of the time mm. textbooks are referred to for as a revision material yeah. so I think it would be inappropriate to use that in a classroom setting where you're teaching yeah. a content for the first time yeah. or you're exposing students to actual practice yeah. so there's little practice in the books but the content could be applicable. In Fourthly we reduced teacher talk and provided ample opportunities for students to practice. Why do you think science teachers talk? <laughs> Why do I think science teachers talk too much? Okay, so I think when it comes to science, we've got biology, chemistry and physics, and everything that we teach in science is so relatable to every single thing that we come into contact on a daily basis. Okay. So it's very easy for science teachers to want to create that in excitement and enthusiasm. So I think with science teachers, they're very passionate about their subject. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes um, stuff and teachers think that by talking a lot, yeah. There's a lot of learning taking place. Truly, why do science teachers talk too much? Because we want to make sure that we get students to properly understand why it is that they're learning what they're learning. You're What's sure the point that? sitting in just front in front of students and specifically saying, right. Here's, do you uh, talk too much? Um, no, we have to I think it's easy to get let's let's put it this way, it's easy to get um, carried away with yeah. the excitement because a yeah. lot of students are gonna have a lot of questions. Yeah. Think about and I think uh, where staff are very passionate about their subject and they're talking a lot. The practice isn't there, there's very little learning taking place. Yeah. Well, I'm being prejudiced here. <laughs> right, so we've moved a long way from that, by the okay. way. Let, let, you know when teachers, especially in science, right? Yeah. right you know there's an old argument that science teachers believe we've got huge content, we've got to cover the content in the best way they felt at yeah. the time. If I don't teach my class, they haven't learned. Obviously, teaching and then learning is two different concepts, two different things. Yeah. You necessarily teaching doesn't mean they're actually understood. Yeah? Do you feel they are pressured? because they have a lot to cover because the content in science, biology, chemistry, physics is quite a lot, isn't it? I mean, so do you think, do you think that, that sometimes they're pressured and they think, actually, I've got a lot to go through, let me just regurgitate the knowledge to them? I think there is definitely a lot of content to cover um, in science and we do have three different subjects within science yeah. but I think I think one th amazing thing at the CSD is that how we sequence our curriculum from year 7 all the way to year 11 yeah. so we are constantly building on those 10 key KOs, key objectives yeah. and because of that staff don't feel like there is a lot of content to cover in a short space of time okay. um, so I think that's something that we do really well at the CSD. Okay. A lot of teaching used to go on, but not necessarily checking if they actually understood what you did. So not much of slop, if you like, our, mm. our current terminology it mm. used to be done. So mm. if you look at books, you, uh, you'd see in a typical lesson, there's loads of notes, and then suddenly one or two questions, lesson's over, you then you realise, did the students actually practice? Now, obviously, our model's different. You'll have a very small amount of time where you present your information during phase two. Yeah. You'll model your activity, and then a large chunk of our double lesson is spent on students practicing, showing you that they've learnt. Yeah. And if they haven't, allowing you to then intervene, do something about that learning that hasn't taken place that you feel needs to. Yeah. So we've, I think, moved a long way. I agree. And, and I, I think you won't find that teacher talk. No, no, I agree. Also, as you mentioned, they shed a lot of practice. We want our students to demonstrate to us whether or not they have learned mm. the, um, the topic at hand. And how can you assess that if you don't, A, give them ample time to demonstrate, and then also give yourself time to go around and check. Finally, we have adopted Rosenshine's explicit direct instructions and worked hard on delivering our curriculum in the classroom with real-time assessment and feedback. Okay, so our, again, it's so back down to our EDI framework where we look at our end goal. What is it that we want the students to ultimately be able to leave that lesson knowing? Yeah. And then we backwards plan. If I know that in one particular lesson, I'm supposed to make sure that the student understands concept on osmosis or the required practical, yeah. I will then have my slop work 
fully associated to that particular topic. Now I think backwards. That's the independent practice, the independent shed load of practice that we call it um, in our in phase four. Phase four, yeah. exactly, the shed load of practice. So then now when I'm planning my lesson, I think I know that this is what the concept of the students need to be aware of. Yeah. When I present my new material in phase two, have I ensured that I'm providing the students with all that information for them to be able to access all of those, um, yeah. those questions during phase four? Yeah. When it comes onto that phase, obviously during phase two as well, during phase three, we'll have those times where presenting new material is happening. I will constantly keep questioning students, making sure we're doing that assessment throughout. Um, obviously, always making sure that we ask questions, um, winny whiteboards, any kind of whole class set of response that we can yeah, do to yeah. assess their learning. Yeah. Because what we don't want to be doing is rushing immediately into phase three and four yeah. if there are still students that don't understand a particular concept. Correct. You're checking for understanding for One hundred percent. There is no point in putting those questions in front of them if they don't know what they're doing. Correct. Once we do reach that phase four, mm. that's when we'll make it quite clear. We set the conditions about what it is that now we are now moving into this. In, it's shed loads of practice. It's going to be an absolute silence. You're going to have absolute 40 minutes, yeah. which I think is such a key strength for us to give students such a large amount of time portion of the lesson to yeah. be able to practice those questions from a hundred minute period out of 100 we'll, minute give, we'll be approximately 40 minutes for them to demonstrate their learning exactly yeah. um in that time obviously we would as teachers we want to make sure that we live mark mm -hmm. what this entails is us circulating the room obviously making sure that we perhaps uh, go to our south students to begin mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and mark their work so when we might potentially look at where maybe one big four mark or a big six mark, something really that we can grip our teeth into and find out how much do the students actually understand of mm. what we have taught them. Mm. We'll go around live marking it and immediately, the, the beauty of this is that as soon as I live mark a piece of work, immediately I can understand the misconceptions that that one student has. Mm -hmm. It allows me to then address it with that one student immediately. The student will get their green pen out and they will then fix their work. Mm -hmm. Immediately, I know, that's the beauty of our life market. It's so instant. Rather than say, for example, the whole of the lesson would happen, I mark their books a couple of days later, realize that there's this misconception and have to come back to it a couple of lessons later mm -hmm. when the students can't even remember the content. Okay, so when we are going around live marking the students' books, of course, DPR would be displayed up on the board. As soon as a new content, a new lesson has obviously been delivered, all the students would happily put them onto developing because now that content has now been taught. As I go around and live mark books and I can see a particular student has understood a concept quite well, um, that's when we can obviously go up to the DPR and we will move them from developing into consolidating. It is positive for a number of different reasons because for me, it allows me to clearly see that the student understands this KO very, very well. There's still a bit more work that needs to be done, but from where our first starting point of the student was, they have obviously progressed quite a bit. Um, obviously, it's a massive achievement for the students, of course, for them to be able to see that they are moving up uh, from developing onto consolidating. It provides that motivation. It provides for everyone in the entire class to see where it is that they are all that they're currently at. It provides good competition as well, a healthy competition amongst the students for them to be able to see, you know, I'm still on developing. What can we do to consolidate it, to secure, to secure ourselves? Um, particularly as they know that their parents are also going to be able to see this. It helps to inform parents where they are currently still weak on. Only how is it that we can move forward? Okay, good. Leadership quality is an essential factor in achieving excellence. And it is undeniable that we are fortunate to have exceptional leaders in our trust. They perform a crucial role in supporting, challenging, tracking and monitoring all our plans and actions without making any assumptions. We all know about Bruce Lee, right? Yeah. It's supposed to be really, really quick, but I don't think he met his brother. Go on. Suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'll lose that one. <laughs> By all means. Nice one. Nice one. All right.